Elside is, is going to be giving us an update on the COVID-19 infections. So Dr. Elside, thank you very much. All right, thanks Faisal for that uh, great introduction. I'm just gonna turn the video off and I'll put it back on at the end uh, just so I can focus on the screen here. Okay, uh, good afternoon, thanks for attending. I'm pleased to deliver this lecture, which uh, I hope you'll enjoy and I'm sure you will. I'll touch upon a number of important issues and new developments related to COVID-19. And um, just show you my disclaimer slide here. Sorry. So I have no disclaimers. Now, some of the views I may express during this talk uh, may not necessarily be uh, reflective of those of LHSC, St. Joe's or Western, but I'm sure most of them will be. So we'll look at the kind of up-to-date epidemiology of COVID-19. We'll look at personal protective equipment and physical distancing, phenomenology or kind of lived experiences or uh, concerns about COVID-19 expressed by members of the population based on literature. We'll look at diagnostics, both uh, detection of the virus and serological detection. We'll talk about therapeutics, uh, specifically potential agents for COVID-19 with uh, an update on current clinical trials. There's an Infectious Disease Society of America guideline that was just published less than a week ago, and then Canadian guidelines, which will come out later uh, this month, and then some final reflections. So this slide actually isn't the epidemic curve of, of COVID-19. It's actually the academic output associated with it. And you can see that the number of publications per 100,000 citations in PubMed are over 1,000. So over 1% of all publications in 2020 uh, in PubMed are due to or related to COVID-19, which is interesting. So there have been three highly pathogenic coronavirus epidemics or pandemics that have occurred over the last 20 years. The greatest one is the one we're currently experiencing with uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, which has a case fatality rate anywhere between 0.1% and 9.5%. And those numbers were quoted because 0.1% is the estimated fatality rate of influenza and 9.5% is the estimated fatality rate or was the fatality rate associated with the SARS coronavirus uh, epidemic that occurred uh, around the world and in Canada in uh, 2004, uh, 2002 to 2004. So we believe the uh, mortality is somewhere in between. In Wuhan, it was about 1.4%, but there are many factors uh, that impact the mortality rate calculations, which I won't get into. Uh, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus was, um, uh, an epidemic that occurred in the Arabian Peninsula in 2012. There's still a few cases that get reported each year. There were outbreaks in South Korea as well. Uh, there are only two cases in the U.S. and none in Canada. So it's, but, but it has a very high, high mortality rate. Uh, about a third of patients die, unfortunately. And then we had SARS-CoV, uh, sometimes called SARS-CoV-1, which, um, as I mentioned, affected uh, the Toronto area, causing 43 deaths, 17.1% fatality in Canada. So looking at COVID-19 uh, epidemiology, the numbers currently, and as you know, you've probably seen some maps on the web, th these numbers change every day. So right now there's over 2 million cases worldwide, about 25% of patients have fully recovered. And there have been unfortunately over 130,000 deaths. In Canada, we've had over 28,000 cases, over 9,000 have recovered, but unfortunately we've had over 1,000 deaths now. And about half of the deaths have occurred in long-term care facilities. And you hear in the news, um, mention of long-term care facility uh, deaths uh, on a daily basis, unfortunately. Uh, as of uh, yesterday, there were 100, sorry, 247 cases in London with 108 resolved uh, and 11 deaths. Now this number changes every day as well. And as you know, in the US, they have almost 650,000 cases with about 30,000 deaths. Uh, I just, I think someone is unmuted. Uh, there are, sorry, this map here shows the World Health Organization uh, affected areas. In the last seven days, you can see obviously the United States and some other countries uh, have a lot of cases. Russia didn't have a lot of reported cases initially, but now they do. And obviously Western Europe and Iran are still uh, impacted a lot. Australia was on the same pace as Canada, but they've started to flatten the curve, if you want to, so to speak, I guess. The Weather Network had, had some beautiful maps of cases of COVID-19 in Canada, and this uh, figure depicts that very clearly here. You can see that most of the cases are in Ontario uh, and Quebec, with uh, Alberta and British Columbia uh, being second and third. British Columbia is having very minimal reported cases. So in the last, let's say, 24 hours, BC reported 27 cases, whereas Ontario reported 494. 
Quebec reported 691 and Saskatchewan reported only one. So uh, there, there, is some difference, there are some differences there. And then this shows the total number of cases in Canada. Uh, this is cumulative, so it's, it's, um, it's obviously going to keep going up, but we're looking at flattening the curve with numbers of new cases, which I'll show you in the next slide. So this is looking at Ontario data. This is from April 14, uh, 2020 from uh, the ministry website, Ontario.ca. We can see that the number of cases reported on a daily basis, this is based on report date, not on the date when the patient started having symptoms. So you can see that the number of cases started escalating around March 11th and then continued to increase. And uh, there were some decreases over the last few days, but uh, yesterday, there was um, a significant increase as was the day before. So we haven't yet flattened the curve here, but we're moving in that direction. You can see that most deaths, 94% of deaths occurred in patients over the age of 60. Most of them occurred over age 80 and only a few occurred in younger patients. Uh, as of a couple of days ago, we had 800 patients hospitalized in the province with about 250 in the ICU and almost 200 mechanically ventilated. This is the map of southwestern Ontario and then the rest of Ontario here showing the rate uh, of confirmed cases, not the number, but the rate of confirmed cases per 100,000 population based on public health unit. You can see Middlesex County is shaded uh, sort of a medium green color, whereas uh, Essex County and Lambton County, where there, there are a lot of healthcare workers moving across the border working at U.S. hospitals, they've had a lot of issues lately uh, with uh, cases of COVID-19 and their, their rates are higher than they are in London. You can see the Greater Toronto Area is also affected, not so much in Hamilton, Niagara, uh, Ottawa is kind of affected similarly to us. So when we talk about flattening the curve, we're obviously talking about uh, the number of, of new cases. And basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, alleviate the pressure that cases of COVID will have on the healthcare system by spreading out the number of cases over time and reducing the number of cases over time. So this curve here, the bigger curve here would be uh, what we would expect if we didn't have any interventions at all. And then the second curve, which is a flattening, would have less area under the curve, but also would be able to um, spread uh, the uh, pandemic out over time so that the healthcare system can deal with it. So our high hand hygiene me measures, personal protective equipment, all the stuff we're doing right now, physical distancing, limiting travel, limiting international travel, closing the borders, working from home, that all uh, will help in that regard. Now, there are some early signs of flattening of the curve in parts of Canada, such as I mentioned, British Columbia and Saskatchewan. However, if we relax physical distancing too early, this could lead to a resurgence in cases. Now, this is a logarithmic graph showing the coronavirus path of, of various countries. Canada is the black line here. The United States is this line here at the top. And you can see here that some countries are starting to flatten the curve. This one here is with Australia. Uh, they were actually on the same traje trajectory as Canada initially, but they started to, their, their path started to diverge. Same thing with uh, South Korea. They also are starting to flatten the curve, but other countries have not yet reached there, including Canada. So how long do we have to keep physically distancing for? Well, there was a study that recently came out of Harvard using a mathematical model to assess different potential outcomes. Uh, with different strategies uh, for mitigating the risk of COVID-19 and the um, uh, persistence of the pandemic. And using their mod modeling studies, they determined that prolonged or intermittent physical distancing may be necessary into 2022. And they even suggested that possibly this may be required even into 2024. And this may help mitigate the possibility of a resurgence if uh, members of the population uh, weren't affected during the initial pandemic. Now, there is an Ipsos poll that was done on April 8th uh, by phone. And uh, through that poll, they found that 26% of Canadians admitted that they're not practicing social distancing. Now, as a result of this concern uh, for a resurgence of um, physical distancing over time, we would obviously expect wintertime outbreaks to occur in the next two years. And this would be the post-pandemic period. It all depends on vaccine availability and herd immunity. Uh, this was an interesting study. It was just published in JAMA Internal Medicine. It was looking at uh, patient concern or individual concerns about COVID-19 by age group and the lifestyle changes that they made. Uh, this was an online cross-sectional survey on three social media platforms, including Twitter, Facebook, and another uh, social media platform, looking at what people felt about COVID-19. So we can see here that most people 
were either moderately, very, or extremely concerned. So about 90% of the population were concerned about COVID-19, about 10% or less were not. It's interesting that the elderly group, greater than 76 years of age, uh, had more, patient, more people being less concerned or a higher proportion being less concerned than others, and it may be related to the fact that they've already reached a, an older age, who knows. Uh, looking at the lifestyle changes, I think we can all relate to this. So 90% of respondents mentioned that they washed their hands more, you can see the rest, social gatherings, stocking up on food, and toilet paper, uh, avoiding domestic travel, working from home, even avoiding the gym, which we've heard of. Uh, and then obviously not attending classes. I mean, we're, we're here on Zoom because of not being able to have grand rounds collectively. So it certainly has uh, changed what we do. Some of these things are good. Some of these things are challenging. Now, I uh, apologize, the reference uh, I, I left out by accident. Uh, there was a paper that was published, I believe it was in uh, JAMA or JAMA Internal Medicine that looked at a mental health pandemic after COVID-19. And recently, the CMAJ just published something yesterday looking at the mental health of healthcare workers dealing with the pandemic. And obviously, we're all in this together and it's having a big toll on us and our patients. Uh, so, you know, physical distancing may have short-term and long-term effects on our mental health and well-being. Now, it's interesting to note that previous large-scale disasters, such as hurricanes, mass shootings in the U.S., and even the SARS epidemic back in 2002, have been associated with increased rates of depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and psychological stress. And we expect, although we don't want to see this, we expect increased rates of anxiety, depression, substance abuse, domestic violence, and child abuse following the COVID-19 pandemic. And there was mention of child abuse being a possibility because of the schools being closed. Looking at the economic implications of COVID-19, we're all worried about the unemployment rate, people filing for unemployment insurance, both in Canada and the US. Uh, on a large scale economic um, perspective, the world ha has a $80 trillion economy. And out of that $80 trillion economy, about $4 trillion is gonna be shaved off in 2012 because of COVID. And that doesn't include the effects of lost education, healthcare costs, mental illness, uh, impacts on health, et cetera. However, we do expect a rebound to occur in the economies of um, all areas of the world, essentially. In developing Asian countries, the economy is expected actually to increase by 1% this year, even with the pandemic, and then increase 8.5%. They're on this trend anyway. They actually had the highest uh, burst of economic activity, but you can see the difference between 2019 and 2020 is, is very similar in the US. They're going down 5.9%, but going back up 4.7%. And uh, on the world scale, you can see that uh, because of some of these emerging economies, they believe the world actually will, will rebound uh, economically. But that is more of a, a global picture of things that doesn't look at individual uh, aspects of economic activity. And certainly there will be some negative repercussions economically, uh, such that the uh, world economy next year won't really make up for what happened this year. Okay, so this is a home-drawn um, cartoon by a family member. Are we running out of uh, PPE? Uh, this is a question that's uh, often uh, been asked um, uh, or thought of by many of us. Certainly, we did have challenges securing uh, PPE. There was the 3M uh, supply that um, the U.S. had uh, tried to block, but eventually came through. Uh, but there's certainly ways that we're addressing this, and I'll show you in the next slide how we are addressing it. But this is probably, this picture probably represents what we were facing last week. <laughs> so we have a made in Canada solution for PPE. So uh, there's a company called the Woodbridge Group, which is a private company uh, that's Canadian owned. It's based in Mississauga. They have facilities in many countries around the world, including the US. And they've collaborated with a company in Japan uh, called Inoak and also McMaster University, the Department of Engineering. And it was a joint venture to produce surgical masks and N95 masks. And they will be rolling these out and uh, these will be available in the Canadian market, but especially in Ontario. These were the masks that Doug Ford was um, uh, promoting when um, they were first uh, manufacturing them. This company also has a facility, interestingly, in Tennessee, and they will likely manufacture the same products for the US market. There's also a company called Medicom, which you may have seen on some of the N95 masks. I don't know if we purchased from them here, but they're based in Montreal, Quebec. They're a very large company. They do produce masks and gloves, and so they're a reliable source of PPE. Canada Goose, which manufactures high-end uh, jackets, has offered to, to produce medical gowns uh, up to 1.5 million in total at, at their cost, at, at cost, sorry. So 
uh, that's also a supply. And there's a company in Kitchener-Waterloo called Insmith, which has Health Canada approved reusable face shields with which they're manufacturing. This slide, I won't go into it in detail. This is basically the Public Health Ontario recommendations for PPE. And you can see that droplet and contact precautions are recommended for any type of activity involving uh, direct patient care, uh, particularly with patients who are suspected of having COVID-19. And the only place where PPE isn't usually required is if you're in an administrative area and you're gonna be farther than six feet away from, from the uh, uh, potential patient. However, there's some evidence that six feet may be too short of a distance and some people are advocating 20 feet. Uh, that's another discussion, but uh, the plexiglass does offer some protection, but uh, certainly um, uh, nothing is 100% protective, uh, whether it's PPE or, physical, or other physical barriers. This is an interesting study. <clears throat> looking at the amount of virus shedding from an infected patient in their exhaled breath. So this is the number of virus copies uh, per sample, uh, logarithmic scale. Uh, this is a nasal swab, so you can see how many virus uh, particles are found in a nasal swab, uh, throat swab here as well. Um, there's a, this is you know a box plot there. And uh, this, is, um, this, is, this is the amount of droplet particles greater than five microns that would be exhaled if the patient wears a mask. These are the amount of particles greater than five microns that would be exhaled if the patient, sorry, this is without a mask and this is with a mask. This is the amount of aerosolized particles uh, ex uh, exhaled by a patient who doesn't wear a mask. And this is the amount with a patient uh, wearing a mask. So you can see that if patients with COVID are wearing a surgical mask, they can reduce the amount of infectious droplets and particles in the, um, uh, adjacent environment. So uh, with the shortage of PPE, now we, we have a better supply of PPE and it's a more uh, secure supply. Uh, many people have looked to making their own PPE. Now these are not medical grade uh, personal protective gear. They're not regulated by Health Canada and they're not a substitute for physical distancing and hand washing. But you can see on the figure on, uh, on the right, uh, what can kind of mimic uh, a surgical mask. So a vacuum cleaner bag, which is often a HEPA filter bag, does approximate that of a surgical mask. So if you can make a mask out of that, that would be actually pretty interesting. Uh, a dish towel actually would, could also be used, but you can use also cotton t-shirts, pillowcases, scarves, and you can see that your percentage filtration decreases. Uh, but certainly it's, it's better than nothing. And it may be useful for short periods of time if you're grocery shopping or you're taking, you know, London Transit. Uh, the World Health Organization recommends against uh, routine wearing of medical grade PPE in community settings, although the CDC does recommend some kind of routine PPE in high risk states. And actually New York State has now over 200,000 cases of COVID with 11,000 deaths. And yesterday the governor uh, had said that he was gonna sign a declaration requiring people to wear masks in public uh, unless they were socially isolated. So if they were walking distant from everyone else in the park, but they, if they were in an environment that they were close to other people, they would have to wear a mask in public. Uh, this is the effect of this of hand sanitizer in a publication that's not yet published. It's, it's in press, but obviously it's published online. Uh, it's, it's due for publication in July. Looking at the effectiveness of various hand sanitizer compounds, whether it's ethanol or isopropyl alcohol, and the hand sanitizers we use are usually 70% of uh, ethanol or isopropyl alcohol. You can see that after 30%, the SARS coronavirus 2 is uh, completely uh, eliminated. Now you have to use hand sanitizer for 20 minutes uh, when you're applying it on and it has to all dry up. And the same thing for hand washing. If you're using hand washing um, uh, in, uh, as a primary mode of, of hand hygiene, you also need to wash for 20 minutes. Isopropyl alcohol does cause uh, tissue toxicity on your skin if the concentration is too high, but we don't use that concentration in commercial products. So uh, jumping to the diagnosis of COVID-19 using uh, microbiologic methods. In our lab, we use real-time PCR, which is a high throughput method. Our uh, throughput can be anywhere from 500 to 1,000 samples a day, but it depends on personnel and then all machines being operational. Uh, sensitivity and specificity, I didn't list the numbers there, but they're subject to determination. The literature has quoted anywhere from 65% to 80%, depending on the assay. And we'll talk about this later on. Uh, lowered respiratory tract specimens, such as bronchoalveolar lavage, uh, tracheal aspirates, are more sensitive than nasopharyngeal swabs, which are more sensitive than 
throat swabs and uh, salivary swabs. There's a commercial salivary assay that was approved by the US FDA recently for testing for COVID-19. Now there's a, a COVID-19 point of care test made by uh, Spartan Bioscience, which actually was founded by a University of Toronto medical microbiologist who uh, graduated from the University of Ottawa Medical School. He um, just received FD, uh, sorry, Health Canada approval to market his test. And now the Ontario government, the Alberta government, and uh, other um, jurisdictions are planning on purchasing uh, this point of care test. Now this test can only do one coronavirus sample at a time and it takes about 30 minutes. So it is rapid, but it's, it's not meant for high throughput testing such as at a hospital, large hospital setting like us, but it does provide an option for remote areas or rural areas. Now testing can't be done just by anyone. These, these tests have to be done under certain conditions. There's a biohazard associated with uh, collecting a sample and processing it. So uh, it still has to be done under the authority of a laboratory. And it probably will be done under the authority of the community labs if it's being done in rural areas. This is a flow pathway, which I won't talk about too much, but basically what do we do if we have a positive test? So if the patient's symptomatic and they're a healthcare worker, they would be sent home, uh, if it's an inpatient, they would be on, on precautions. If it's an ambulatory patient, they would be also sent home. Now, they would be recommended to have testing done in the community or if it's an inpatient in the hospital. And if the COVID-19 test is positive, then they would either be on 14 days of home isolation or they would remain on isolation in the room. Or they can remain on 10 days of isolation. And then if they're symptom-free for 48 hours, they can have a repeat test. And that repeat test can be done every 48 hours until it's negative up until about day 14. Or we can just say, well, let's just do 14 days. Am I symptom-free? Great. If I'm not symptom-free, uh, continue until is continue isolation until 48 hours symptom-free. If the COVID test is negative, then we need to rule out other causes, so other respiratory virus PCR. However, the respiratory season has ended for most other respiratory viruses, and we're not doing routine PCR for influenza RSV, except with permission from the lab or unless the patient's critically ill. Looking at virus shedding after COVID-19 symptoms, we can see that early on in the disease, there's some variation in the um, uh, amount of virus present. So the CT or cycle threshold value is the cycle of the PCR assay that um, virus is detectable at, or first detectable at. So the lower the CT value, the higher the amount of virus. So we can see early on in the first couple of days, uh, virus in, um, this is nasopharyngeal swab, starts to uh, increase in amount and then uh, it starts decreasing over time. Interestingly, throat swabs start off a little bit higher, then go down and uh, may not be detectable actually. So cycle 40 is usually the cycle where we consider the PCR assay to be negative. We can see that there's a gradual trend towards uh, PCR negativity over time. We show up to day 21 here, but uh, some papers have shown that patients can have detectable uh, virus at uh, 36 days or even longer. Now, whether or not this is dead virus or live virus, we don't know. Uh, but that's certainly uh, um, under investigation. So can we rely on a negative COVID-19 test? Uh, the accurate diagnosis um, of COVID-19 obviously is essential to curb uh, the uh, pandemic globally and locally. There is no perfect test for COVID-19 and neither is there any perfect test for any condition that we treat in medicine. Accuracy will depend on many factors. It'll depend on the amount of virus shedding, it may depend on genetic factors of the individual, the specimen collection technique, so who did it, from what site, how samples are handled, uh, transport time, the analytic methods used. So, you know, we use a real time PCR assay, a very robust assay. Now, up to 30% of tests uh, may be negative as per the literature, and patients can still be infectious even if they have a negative test. So, repeat testing may be necessary to enhance sensitivity. Now, some jurisdictions don't believe that we should be, we should be testing everyone, uh, such as British Columbia, and they are actually seeing a, a flattening of the curve. So uh, whether we have to test everyone or more people is uh, subject to evaluation. Now, a recent study looked at a modeling of uh, infectivity, uh, sorry, modeling of uh, positive tests in uh, nasal and throat swabs. This is not nasal pharyngeal swab uh, samples. This is nasal and throat. And you can see obviously that virus detectability decreases over time in a kind of log, uh, in a negative logarithmic curve uh, going towards zero just after day 30. So some people have thought of serology as a potential uh, alternative to, or um, adjunct to PCR for COVID-19, and this may be helpful. 
with epidemiologic investigations and also for the identification of asymptomatic cases and looking at the population retrospectively to see what happened during the pandemic. Now, late seroconversion uh, may limit the utility of serology in the early phase of illness or for kind of diagnosing someone who's ill. Again, it may take 10 days for antibodies to develop over time. And so this may not be um, helpful in that regard, but it certainly may be uh, good at having a rear mir mirror view of, of what happened. Uh, it does have the potential to assess herd immunity and seroprotection. So what is the status of uh, serologic assays for COVID-19? Now, there are three FDA-approved assays uh, that are shown here. Uh, I just showed the sensitivity and specificity of the first one based on testing at two, two Chinese hospitals. I haven't verified that information. There were two other ones that were just approved yesterday uh, from two different diagnostic companies. But unfortunately, there are hundreds of companies that are marketing serologic assays in the US. And that is based on a loosening of the regulations by the FDA. The FDA does not need to certify these assays for them to be marketed. As long as these companies have internal data showing that their assays are uh, reliable, uh, they can market their products. And, and these, this data doesn't have to be turned into the FDA. So it's, it probably will, run, uh, will cause a disaster to happen. There are gonna be inaccurate tests, and this is gonna misguide the management of COVID-19 in the US, and it's gonna hamper the recovery from coronavirus, possibly. Now, there are no Health Canada approved assays. Now, there is um, our biochemistry group here at LHSC um, uh, is looking at um, uh, one commercial product from Europe uh, for COVID-19, and there are other centers that um, are um, uh, studying uh, serologic assays. There's a little mark on my There's a little circle on the, uh, oh, there we go, okay. Uh, sorry, just next slide. So, um, so that was serology. Now we'll move on to pharmacotherapeutics for COVID-19. Various agents that have in vitro activity against SARS-CoV have been identified, SARS-CoV-2, but uh, there's uh, limited data to guide therapeutic decision-making and clinical trials are ongoing. And we'll talk about these in the next uh, few slides. This slide here shows a representation of the life cycle of SARS-CoV-2 and potential drug targets. Now the bottom half of the figure is the alveolar cell and the, the kind of top third is the uh, alveolus per se. We can see the uh, SARS coronavirus here with uh, an S protein or spike protein and an envelope protein which allows it to get into the cell. There's another uh, protein called uh, type two transmembrane serin protease or TMPRSS2 which together with the envelope protein allows the cell to be endocytosed. Now there are various targets in the life cycle. So uh, once the virus enters, the RNA uh, is released and uh, uh, translation occurs and um, there, there's a proteolysis that happens. And then there's also RNA uh, amplification that occurs and then new viruses are made and they're shed out of the cell to infect the next cell. But there are various targets. So chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, they affect membrane fusion and endocytosis and also have immunomodulatory effects. There are other agents here, which I won't talk about, uh, but uh, lopinavir, which is an HIV drug, same with uh, darunavir, they infect the proteolysis phase. They're protease inhibitors. So that's how they work. Remdesivir, vivipravir, and ribavirin, they affect RNA-dependent RNA, -dependent RNA um, polymerase, which is also one of the targets we use for PCR, for detecting the virus. And then we have uh, tolicizumab and serolimumab, which are interleukin-6 soluble receptor inhibitors. They are targeted towards the cytokine storm that may occur with COVID-19. So obviously when we need to make clinical decisions, we need to rely on the best available evidence. We've always been told that randomized clinical trials are the best um, uh, type of study for that. And, and they are in terms of unfiltered information, but looking at filtering of the literature, we need to look at systematic reviews, which obviously uh, take time and they're not, there's not as many of them. And then also other evidence uh, syntheses that are done. So antimalarials in COVID, I showed how chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are supposedly effective against viral entry into the cell. Now the US Food and Drug Administration had an emergency use authorization a few weeks ago that gave physicians the option to prescribe these drugs. But unfortunately, they declared a national drug shortage, shortage three days later. And some state um, pharmacy boards had shut down using these drugs for other than what they have approval for. So hydroxychloroquine is used uh, for lupus, for rheumatoid arthritis, 
And so some states have restricted use for those conditions because of the shortage. And many patients have, have, have had difficulty accessing these drugs for their chronic medical conditions. Now, the EMA or the European Medical uh, Medicines Agency has stated that studies have not yet documented that these agents can effectively treat COVID-19. The World Health Organization states that there is insufficient data available to determine the efficacy of these agents in the prevention or treatment of COVID-19. Now, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are not without toxicity. They can cause cardiovascular side effects, such as increased QT prolongation, congestive heart failure, other arrhythmias, bundle branch block, et cetera. They are associated with ototoxicity and psychosis, and on a long-term basis, they can cause ocular problems. Now, just a few days ago, actually April 12th, there was a study in Brazil looking at high-dose chloroquine versus low-dose chloroquine for the treatment of COVID-19. Now, uh, they did not use a placebo group in that study, but 11 patients in the high-dose chloroquine group had died from fatal heart arrhythmias as a result of chloroquine. And so that, that study was shut down. It was reported in the New York Times and it's been reported in other uh, circles of the media. The, the patients in this study were also given azithromycin, which also prolongs the QT interval. So there was a question of whether or not uh, that could have uh, played a role, which it likely did. So we're going now to cytokine, cytokine storm which uh, has a role to play in terms of one of the drug targets I mentioned earlier on in the life cycle of COVID-19, and that has to do with the uh, interleukin-6 uh, pathway. So uh, with cytokine storm, we see an increased concentration of pro-inflammatory cytokines, and usually or often in the ICU people, uh, critical care people can, can comment on this, but corticosteroids have often been used in this setting now, this is believed to be important in the pathogenesis of COVID-19, and this may involve not just interleukin-6, but a number of other interleukins and inflammatory markers. So interferon gamma, uh, macrophage, chemotactic protein 1, et cetera, et cetera. Now, with the cytokine storm, there's a concern that this may lead to progression of ARDS, cardiovascular collapse, multi-organ failure, and death due to uh, dysfunction of the alveolar capillary uh, blood gas exchange. Uh, process. Now, early identification and management of cyto cytokine storm is believed to be an important therapeutic target in patients with COVID-19. So basically, during infection, pathog pathogen recognition by the host triggers cellular recruitment and a pro-inflammatory cytokine response, including interleukin-6 and, and other inflammatory uh, markers or pro-inflammatory markers. The inflammatory process usually leads to pathogen clearance and a return to immune homeostasis and resolution of the infection, but sometimes the uh, immune recognition is delayed or it's evaded. And then this can lead the pathogen to proliferate. There's more uh, cytokines, so you get hypercytokinemia, and this leads to tissue, tissue damage and post-cell death, unfortunately. So interleukin-6 inhibitors and cytokine storm, there's a hypothesis that IL-6 inhibitors may be effective in a subgroup of patients who have cytokine storm. Tolicizumab, which is a monoclonal, uh, a humanized monoclonal interleukin-6 soluble receptor inhibitor, has been included in the seventh edition of the Chinese manual uh, guiding uh, treatment of COVID-19. It's also been um, uh, restricted uh, for use in this setting in various hospitals in the U.S. And I believe uh, in uh, Toronto, there is a restriction there uh, for use in cytokine storm on an individual patient basis. Now, um, Again, if, if use in, in the Chinese manual, the option is for severe COVID-19 with extensive pulmonary changes and increased interleukin-6 levels. Now, looking at uh, the published data, there's very limited information in the literature. There is a single center retrospective case series of 15 patients in China. Looking at uh, tolicizumab, now these patients were also given, um, or, or most of these patients were also given methylprednisolone or methylprednisone and uh, so it was difficult to determine how effective the tolicizumab was. In either event, uh, almost half the uh, patients who were critically ill um, had died in this study. Uh, there have been isolated case reports, mostly in non-critically ill patients, and there's also a paper that I recently saw that uh, has been submitted for publication. Now, there is preclinical evidence that interleukin-6 may actually be important in the early phase of viral infections and that inhibiting it may actually result in unintended adverse um, outcomes or consequences. So in conclusion, the efficacy and safety has not been demonstrated. Uh, use of tolicizumab in other uh, conditions and in um, rheumatic conditions 
has been associated with post-marketing surveillance uh, detection of, of deaths. There have been over a thousand deaths associated with um, the use of this drug. And uh, it's, it's difficult to determine how safe it is to use in general, uh, not just in COVID-19. Uh, the toxicities of IL-6 inhibitors also include bacterial, mycobacterial, viral, and fungal superinfections, reactivation of hepatitis B and C, GI perforation, including diverticulitis, demyelinating disease, including multiple sclerosis and chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, drug-induced liver injury or liver failure, and also recently osteonecrosis of the jaw. These drugs are not cheap. Uh, initially, I was given a quote of about $10,000 or $9,000 for two doses, which is not what was given in the uh, trial that I mentioned. They were given uh, more doses than that. Uh, sorry, I apologize. There is uh, one other trial that looked at more than two doses for this drug, but two doses seem to be uh, what was used in most of the cases that reported. It's about $4,000 based on the, the dosing regimen here. And the recommendation that I'm giving is that we should avoid use of these agents in COVID-19 until clinical trial or uh, data are available. Uh, we'll talk about uh, tolicizumab a little bit later. Remdesivir is another agent that has shown promise in early studies. It's a nucleotide analog that inhibits viral RNA polymerases. It uh, has in vitro broad spectrum activity against SARS-CoV, that's the SARS virus that we had 15 years ago, uh, MERS and Ebola. And it also has demonstrated in vitro activity against SARS-CoV-2 and it appears to have a favorable safety profile. Now, there was a publication that was just released uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine on, the, on the experience with compassionate use of remdesivir for patients with severe COVID-19. It was a small size cohort with a short duration of follow-up and a significant amount of data was missing. And basically, uh, in that trial, there were, were no de definitive conclusions that could be made, although uh, the drug was found to be uh, fairly safe. Looking at clinical trials, there's a solidarity trial that is an international trial headed by the World Health Organization and some of its partners. And the Canadian arm of the trial is uh, running. It's called CATCO. There are four treatment options, hydroxychloroquine with chloroquine, lopinavir, ritonavir uh, with interferon beta or lopinavir, ritonavir without interferon beta and uh, remdesivir. It's a randomized study, but it's open label. Uh, there's also a COVID-19 uh, post-exposure prophylaxis preemptive therapy study uh, going out of Minnesota. I think some of our colleagues here are linked with that, uh, with that study. Uh, remdesivir, there were two randomized clinical trials that were just terminated, one last week and one, I think it was yesterday. Due to poor enrollment, these trials were running out of China and because of how well controlled COVID-19 has been recently, they didn't have enough people to enroll, so they had to terminate the study. There are other randomized trials uh, in progress, including the one in solidarity. Tolicizumab, there are eight trials currently going on uh, with six currently recruiting. Uh, there's probably more that have been entered uh, in the uh, clinical trials databases. And we'll talk about convalescent plasma, but convalescent plasma trials are also underway as well. So convalescent plasma. Convalescent plasma is used for the treatment and prevention uh, of several infectious diseases. It has been used for SARS-CoV, MERS, and the 2009 H1N1 pandemic with some evidence of safety and efficacy demonstrated. There is an assumption that SARS-CoV-2 being similar to SARS-CoV and MERS might be a promising treatment option. Uh, and it's thought that patients who have convalesced from COVID-19 infection may be able to donate uh, their blood um, and their, their, their serum for uh, infusion in a patient who is uh, severely ill uh, with COVID. There are clinical trials underway and there actually are a few publications looking at the uh, effectiveness of these agents uh, the, the problem is, is patients who have COVID-19 um, with a high severity of illness may already have antibodies produced. If you look at the titers of patients with COVID-19 who are severely ill, many of those patients have titers that are like 1 in 640 or 1 in 320. And by giving an infusion of antibody from a potential donor, it may not significantly increase the titer uh, of antibody for the, uh, the recipient. And so uh, these are still subject to evaluation. There are a few papers out there uh, talking about how to collect samples, the effectiveness. Uh, there was a systematic review uh, that was that looked at just acute respiratory virus infections. I'll show you the uh, findings of this study, but there is there is some evidence. Uh, but again, uh, clinical trials are underway. So looking at immunotherapy for a, a severe acute respiratory infections, there is uh, this was a systematic review with the odd ratios and the rates given for each of the publications. 
you can see um, that the overall uh, odds ratio of protection uh, was under one uh, for uh, looking at all of these studies uh, that had more than five patients in this systematic review. So there may be some potential benefit. Uh, this study that was just published showed uh, CT scan improvements with convalescent serum. You can see, I mean, doesn't show complete coherence, but this is a patient who had severe disease with pulmonary involvement before convalescent plasma and um, after. And then the one at the bottom is not as impressive, but you can still see the changes there. So we'll um, talk about whether or not we should use some of these unproven therapies. What are the, or what is the ethics of using unproven therapies? Is it ethically permissible to provide unproven interventions to seriously ill COVID-19 patients, such as experimental agents, like remdesivir or agents that are currently improved for other indications such as hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, tolicizumab. We need to have two considerations here. One is the integrity of the medical profession in terms of making sure that we're unbiased, that there's no pharma influence. You know, many drug companies will push their drugs to be used on an experimental basis. Now, it might be different from a compassionate use where the, the drug is provided free of charge, uh, but trying anything that might work might not necessarily be the best approach because it might also cause some harm. There are also resource constraints as well. So if we put in, uh, we, if we use something that is a big cost for the healthcare system, it may not be used for something where we do have evidence uh, for use of that drug. So those are things to consider. Now, looking at guidance for using unproven therapies, it, it basically goes from the lowest part where there's no evidence to support use, but there might be a plausible mechanism of action all the way to safety and, uh, and relevance, uh, safety uh, and effectiveness in relevant animal model models also, as well as past phase one and phase two studies. Now, looking at providing access to unproven therapies, what is the antimicrobial stewardship perspective on this? We need to look at kind of the four common ethical themes we often uh, have heard about in medical school or nursing school, uh, beneficence. So if the interventions can help and there is a chance for benefit, then the treatment should be considered if a poor outcome is expected without any intervention. Obviously, we need to um, have the patient be informed and voluntary consent must be given if we're providing uh, experimental therapies. So autonomy is important. Non-maleficence, obviously the life-saving therapies we give should not cause any short-term and or long-term harm. There may be a trade-off involved. And then we're looking at justice as well. This is often the major, major op uh, obstacle to using experimental, experimental therapies. The cost of interventions, uh, being considered might be better spent in other ways for other conditions. We saw the example, for instance, for using hydroxychloroquine. Now there's a drug shortage. Uh, some of these other agents that have been considered, there's also a shortage of these agents. So the patients who need them who have uh, very strong evidence for their use may not be able to access them when we're using them in conditions where we don't have evidence for their use. So there are some uh, significant and important limitations on resources for patients. Uh, healthcare systems, and also uh, providers. Now, uh, this is a paper that, that is impressed in intensive care medicine. It was um, uh, published by the Surviving uh, Sepsis Campaign Group, which is a 36, uh, expert, 30, 36 individual expert working group from 12 countries who participated in the release of this guideline. And you can see a number of recommendations here. Uh, you can see convalescent plasma is not um, is, is a, a, a suggest against recommendation. So they suggest against using convalescent plasma for critically ill adults with COVID-19. They suggest against using IVIG, lopinavir, ritonavir, but they have insufficient evidence to issue any recommendation for the use of any anti, other antivirals, recombinant interferons, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, and also interleukin-6 uh, um, inhibitors in critically ill patients. So uh, the Infectious Disease Society of America recently released guidelines on the treatment and management of patients with COVID-19. These were just published on the weekend at around April 10th, I think it was. And this was based on a systematic review of the peer and gray literature. They looked at seven, uh, sorry, they made seven treatment recommendations and provided narrative summaries of other treatments undergoing evaluations. And they acknowledged that there's a current knowledge gap uh, and they aimed at avoiding premature favorable recommendations for potentially ineffective or harmful interventions. And their overall arching goal was that patients should be recruited into ongoing clinical trials to determine treatment efficacy and safety rather than be trialed outside of trials uh, with these drugs. And for most of the agents that they looked at, they were unable to determine a, um, 
favorable risk, sorry, a, a favorable benefit to risk or risk benefit ratio. Now, the authors of this publication were from the United States, Canada, and China. And they represented multiple specialties, infectious diseases, both adults and pediatrics, critical care, nephrology, GI, public health, microbiology, pharmacy, as well as uh, research methodologists. These are the guidelines summarized here. So for hospitalized COVID-19 patients, they stated that hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine should be used in the context of a clinical trial. They didn't say should only be used. However, for the next three categories, hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, plus azithromycin, lopinavir, ritonavir, or tolizizumab, they recommended that these should only be used in the context of a clinical trial and not outside of a clinical trial, even in situations where there might not be any other feasible option for the patient. Convalescent plasma, they recommended that it should be used in the context of a clinical trial, but they didn't use the word only there. Uh, for pneumonia due to COVID-19, corticosteroids are not recommended. And for ARDS, corticosteroids are recommended in the context of, a, or should only be used in the context of a clinical trial. So as we know, guidelines cannot always account for individual variation among patients, and they're not intended to replace uh, physician judgment in special clinical circumstances. So we need to uh, take that into consideration. Now, uh, there are no current Canadian guidelines yet, but EMI Canada is working on guidelines, which I believe will be released very soon, probably by the end of the month. And um, these will be focused on kind of an antimicrobial stewardship lens of using COVID-19 therapies um, in this regard. So there are some new potential therapeutic agents for COVID-19. Um, one is recombinant human erythropoietin, believe it or not. It was just recently published, but it's difficult to know whether or not um, that is gonna be effective. Uh, clinical trials are required. Melatonin, interestingly. Melatonin has been shown to um, have a potential effect on COVID-19 through its interaction with uh, various interleukins, uh, kind of inhibiting cytokine storm and inflammation. I'll show you a figure on that. And then there have also been some kind of drug discovery uh, publications looking at potential drugs that were screened using 3D computer-assisted models against the virus. And two agents were interestingly found, adazanavir and teotropium, believe it or not, as drugs that may have activity against COVID-19. Please don't try these. Uh, unless they're done through a clinical trial, but certainly uh, you wonder, you know, we could probably do a retrospective study looking at patients who got teotropium uh, with COVID, but, but that's uh, maybe the respirologist could uh, look into that. Anyways, uh, melatonin, this was just published. It's actually, um, I think, published in the June edition of Life Sciences, the, the journal. Uh, and you can see here the pathway of um, uh, SARS-CoV uh, or the cytokine storm, I guess. Uh, and how melatonin works in different conditions. But basically, melatonin is believed to interact by inhibiting cytokine storm and decreasing uh, the immune response by uh, decreasing the recruitment of uh, inflammatory cells and other immune cells. So a potential role for melatonin uh, in COVID-19, but again, um, should be used in clinical studies, and it may only be used as an adjuvant, perhaps, um, as well. I believe there is a, a clinical uh, trial looking at melatonin when I last looked at clinical trials back up. This was the paper I mentioned where they looked at different agents through a 3D uh, drug target interaction model. And as you can see here from the drugs that we kind of use for um, other conditions, like adazanavir is used for HIV, you can see that adazanavir seems, seems to have the highest affinity score for COVID-19. And uh, teotropium, something we use obviously for uh, COPD, um, uh, seems to have a high affinity score for the non-antimicrobials that were screened. But interestingly, that is, um, that's interesting. So adazanavir seems to be the best uh, antiviral uh, compound having potent activity against SARS-CoV-2, but this prediction needs to be validated in vivo, uh, including clinical trials for both efficacy and safety. So um, I was supposed to put a Scrabble picture here, but I didn't. Um, I, I think I left this off by accident, but uh, preparing for the next pandemic. So what we do now in this uh, pandemic really will help us prepare for the next pandemic in terms of our strategies. Uh, certainly, we don't want to exhaust our healthcare resources uh, with this pandemic so that we're not prepared with the next pandemic. So we need to kind of look at that. And again, healthcare resource, healthcare system resource utilization is going to be very important because our healthcare system is already strained and we're not sure um, what we're going to face in the future. So certainly we're gonna be challenged in terms of healthcare system funding because of what we're dealing with now.
So in summary, COVID-19 is the single largest public health threat of our era. Everyone from patients, healthcare workers, and the general public has been affected in some way, shape, or form. Detection, tracking, control, and, and treatment of COVID-19 are high priorities, and results of clinical trials will help guide next steps. And uh, I'm open to questions. I will uh, open my uh, video, and I uh, hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. El Said. Uh, so the one question is, what has BC done that Ontario hasn't to flatten the curve earlier? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, BC initially had their outbreak occur in kind of the nursing home setting. And uh, they took a very, they were actually the first towards uh, dealing with kind of the COVID problem. So from a time perspective, there's a time bias there. And uh, again, because the cases were kind of clustered, that was a little bit easier to contain. And so they had um, probably measures to uh, stop the outbreak there. Now, again, you know, Ontario also had a few cases later on, uh, first in Toronto, and then, you know, London had the third case in Ontario, the fourth case in Canada. And certainly London has fared very well overall. But I, I, again, it's hard to know what factors that they didn't do as widespread testing as we did here. Uh, they didn't shut their schools down earlier than we did here. Uh, so it could be just how it could be time plus um, a time bias, but also a clustering of, of cases. And the provincial, um, you know, Bonnie Hendry, uh, who used to work for the BC CDC, she uh, had, you know, had very good leadership in the uh, management of the, um, of the outbreak there. So a kind of a similar question is that, um, you know, in, in Ontario, it was mentioned that the curve may be starting to flatten. How much do you think is, is this from under testing? That's the question. Are, are we under testing or are we finally starting to catch up? Yeah, certainly, I mean, testing is important. I think initially we were under testing. Um, you know, we have these two assessment centers in London. So just so people know, the microbiology lab at London Health Sciences Center, they're testing everyone from our affiliated hospitals. They're testing all healthcare workers who report to Oc Health, who then get tested at the regional assessment centers. We're also doing all of the testing for hospitalized patients and healthcare workers in Windsor, Chatham, Sarnia, Woodstock, St. Thomas, uh, Ingersoll, Tilsonburg, and Strathroy. And certainly in collaboration with the uh, Middlesex London Health Unit, we've expanded our reach for testing. So the, um, you know, we have these pathways for doing repeat testing on patients who are positive, or even if a patient who is falsely negative or, or negative and we suspect COVID-19, we still recommend testing in those settings. We're recommending social distancing. Uh, so not everybody needs to be tested if they're kind of away from everyone else, but certainly, you know, there's also a cost with testing everyone. We don't want to create panic as well, but certainly uh, we were under testing before and now I think we've expanded the reach. Our capacity has increased. The capacity of Ontario is now 10,000 tests per day. Uh, we've caught up on a lot of the backlog. So some of the data you see might be skewed because of uh, you know, results coming out all at once because of a backlog. But, um, you know, the, the, the rural areas uh, may be areas where we're not reaching uh, in terms of people getting tested. And certainly with these, some, of, well, some of these point of care tests, we may be able to, to reach them there. Uh, but certainly in the high density areas like Toronto, London, that's where test, testing is going to be important. So one comment about serologic tests is that uh, the potential low positive predictive value in the context of a low prevalence of infection in the general population. And uh, this individual mentions that it may be more useful in high risk subgroups such as healthcare workers. Do you wanna comment? Yeah, so I think the studies uh, initially are probably gonna look at patients who have already had COVID-19 and they may go back to saved serum samples. So. Uh, as this uh, pandemic uh, is ongoing and we manage some patients, we may, and again, it, that's not me doing the study. There are some of my colleagues who are, uh, if they're here listening, they can comment on that. But I, I suspect that we will be looking at retrospective safe samples, looking to see if there's any serologic response with perhaps uh, cases or maybe volunteers who may have had contact with COVID patients. Uh, we don't know what the seroprevalence is, and that's going to be very important in the U.S., the um, serologic assays are not regulated for the most part. And so that data is gonna be um, inconsequential, I guess. It's, it, but I think uh, it's gonna take time before we understand the serologic profile of this virus. Uh, certainly, mm -hmm. in SARS, certainly in SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV, there wasn't a very widespread uh, serologic response after those viruses in terms of globally. 
So the next two questions are kind of related, so I'll try and combine them. What are the data between the change in policy of two consecutive negative tests being the threshold for a turn to work? And um, in an assessment center, they did see individuals that ted tested positive, did their 14-day isolation, return to be retested, and are still positive despite being asymptomatic. Are they safe to return to work? Some of these people are three or four weeks later and are still coming back positive. Right. So uh, I've talked to the health unit about that, and I've talked with some of my colleagues. We don't really know for sure. Now, it's possible that this virus is dead virus and it's persisting. Uh, I know that the health unit has sometimes let people go after they've uh, reached 14 days of isolation, even if they test positive on repeat samples, including healthcare workers. But I've received emails from others uh, indirectly uh, stating that um, they need to keep getting retested or they haven't been let go by the health unit. So I think we need to clarify that. Uh, but some people are postulating that detection beyond a certain time represents dead virus and not live virus. However, we don't know that for sure. The only way to know is to take a swap sample to try to grow the virus, which we don't do here. Uh, but it's hard to, uh, I think we need to talk about that more. What are your thoughts on reports of recurrent infections? And is there evidence that SARS-2 CoV-2 does not produce sustained immunity? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I guess we don't know that. Um, we haven't really looked at serologic responses. Uh, it's believed by some experts. Now, I was listening to the radio uh, yesterday or the day before, Anthony Fauci, the US um, infectious disease um, lead that you've seen on the news. He stated in his news interview that he expects that we will have, uh, th that people who have COVID-19 may have sustained immunity, even asymptomatic patients but we don't really know. We don't have enough data to know that. Okay, the next three questions are a bit related. and They're about repeated swabs. So with high clinical suspicion, is there a utility to repeat swabs given the low sensitivity? And if the COVID test is negative and the patient's presenting with a respiratory illness that has you concerned, would you recommend a second negative test before taking the patient off, uh, um, let's say, uh, air precautions if they're on high flow oxygen, let's say? And um, why not test twice, as another individual says? Uh, if the viral load is low, it'll be negative. Wouldn't repeat testing, shouldn't that be the norm? So yeah, all that, around repeat testing. Yeah, so that's a challenging question. So certainly um, the, um, uh, the, the indication for testing is based on, on clinical indication. So if you think the patient clinically may have COVID and your first test is negative, then you could argue that a repeat test should be given, even if it's the same swab type. Now, preferably, if you have a patient who's intubated, uh, you can get a trach aspirate, or if you need a, a bronch, if you can get a bronchoscopy sample, if that's indicated that those specimens have higher higher yields on PCR than, let's say, a nasopharyngeal swab. But certainly, if there's a need to test, you would. Now, if your second test is negative, but you have a clinical suspicion of COVID, you may it may not necessarily indicate doing a third test. You may just need to isolate that patient until they're better um, empirically. It's very tough. You know, we're getting more data on how sensitive some of the assays are, but as you know. Some assays uh, may fail to pick up the, ice, the uh, virus, and it depends on the stage of illness the patient is in. Uh, so okay. even okay, yeah. you have 30 seconds to answer the last question. Is there any high quality clinical trial data supporting some of the common things we are doing, such as physical distancing? Yeah, I don't know if I saw that. Now, there, there are some clinical trials looking at vitamin C, like high dose vitamin C, uh, which hasn't been, hasn't been proven to be effective. But uh, that was one thing that was on my mind to look at clinical trials for that, but that you can see that that's very difficult to do because that's basically controlling someone's life. Um, um, and so it's hard to control the environment of physical distancing, but it did cross my mind a few days ago to look for that, but I didn't, I didn't check. Okay. Well, the Dr. El that was an amazing review. Thank you very much for, uh, for a great talk and thank you everyone for attending. Uh, take care. Bye. Thanks everybody. Samira, I'll have the uh, video up on the website shortly. Okay, great.